Okay, well, we're getting started. So, welcome everybody to the session on threat hunting. Um, has everybody heard the story about Dick Cheney's pacemaker? So, after Dick Cheney left the uh, vice presidency, he was he had had a history of heart trouble, and so they put in a pacemaker. And I was reading through the article, they were talking about all the heart troubles he'd had and the pacemaker they put in, and they said, oh yeah, and by the way, the Secret Service told us we had to turn off the Wi-Fi. And we're like, wait a minute, you have Wi-Fi and a pacemaker? Now my grandmother had a pacemaker in the 70s. And if you go think about the stupidity of whether putting a Wi-Fi chip into a pacemaker for downloads or updates or those kinds of things, the reality is the fact that they had him turn it off but everybody else is running around with pacemakers that have Wi-Fi turned on should give us a moment of pause. So I went, I, I began looking into this and actually almost every device that's out there now is beginning to have Wi-Fi put in. And the reason why is they want to do over-the-air updates, they want to be able to upload logs. So I actually have a colleague that I work with that is a diabetic and he's got a, um, an insulin pump. And so he has a, a sensor on his arm that's connected with Bluetooth to the pump and then he's got Wi-Fi in the pump uh, that will allow them to do the over there updates or to let them do update the uh, the parameters of however they're much they're putting in there. And I asked him, I said, do you realize you have a Wi-Fi in there? He goes, yeah. You realize how insecure that is? Yeah. And the reality is, is that every device that we're getting out there, which is a medical device, is now becoming an IoT device that's now connected to the world over something that actually isn't very secure. So, one of the problems we find in the medical industry is that they're putting these things in the devices that people don't understand and don't understand the implications and they're not doing what we're going to do today, which is to um, go through a threat hunting exercise. So how many people have done threat hunting? Okay, a couple of people. Everybody should raise your hand. You've been doing threat hunting since you were a child. When your parents taught you looking both ways when you cross the road, that's threat hunting. The other day, my family and I were on the last leg of a 25-mile bike ride. We went into town on the, on the, on the trail, uh, and three teenagers, three male teenagers, came up out of uh, another road. And so I'm sitting here thinking, well, there's just three teenagers out having a good Saturday afternoon, or those some of them I have to worry about. So my family was actually a little farther behind me, so I had to slow down, wait till they catch up, and then we went past. Again, it's thread hunting. We do that any time that we are... Anytime we're in darkness, isolation, insecurity, which all of our software runs in those environments. So what we have learned over the last 20 or 30 years, especially of how we've had penetrations, is that perimeter security is no longer enough. The bottom line is they're gonna get inside. As we'll talk a little bit later, we're more worried now about the exfiltration of data than we are about trying to keep them out because we realize it's almost an impossible task. So threat hunting is about understanding the nature of the threat. How is it that they're going to get inside? How are they going to come after us? But it's also understanding the nature of the attackers. I hear CEOs all the time saying, well, you know, we have to get lucky every time, but the hackers have to get lucky only once. No, if you're depending on luck to protect your systems or your company, I guarantee you the luck is going to go the other way. Luck is the residue of design. Hackers understand that. It's about motivation. It's about their their planning, it's about their knowledge, it's about their intentions of what they want to do. And if we don't have the same kinds of, of intentions, if we don't have that same kind of luck, then they're always going to win. So today, in order to go through, um, before we sort of go through the, 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 whole, the, the um, process that we're gonna go through with a system, it's important to talk about how is it that people get in and how is it that they plan those attacks to come after us. Has anybody ever heard of an intrusion kill chain? Unless you were in my talk at CPPCon. Yeah, so most people haven't. So intrusion kill chains are actually based on military kill chains. So it's find, fix, and finish. You find your enemy, you fix them in a position, and then you attack to finish them off. It's a little more complicated, so they're sort of the steps, and then you go find the next person. So what we've done is we've adapted those kinds of things for uh, intrusions into our systems because it really has become almost militarized. So intrusion kill chains, uh, the one we'll talk about today was developed by Lockheed Martin and what it does is it talks about how you go about penetrating a system. So what are the steps that you would use? Um, and this becomes sort of the, 
um, the sort of the necessary first step. If we're going to threat model a system correctly, we have to understand how that process works and how people wind up getting inside of our, of our systems. There's another one called MITRE's attack matrix. Um, I prefer the, the Lockheed Martin, which is this one. Um, so I like this version of the intrusion kill chain because it's simple, it's straightforward, and it's easy for people who don't have a deep security background to understand. So there are seven steps, and we're gonna go through these, and we're gonna talk about them in the context of a, a real world attack that happened um, at the earlier part of this decade. Um, keep in mind as we go through this, you've done this over and over and over again in your life. When you drive a car, you're threat modeling. Nobody, nobody in here has parents who said, you know, go out and play in the road, it'll be fine, the cars will stop for you. Um, everything that you've done in your life since then when you visit a new town, you're using these exact same kinds of techniques that we're gonna use today. So this should be very natural for you when we actually go to, to do this. So the first thing is reconnaissance. Um, followed by weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and uh, action on objectives. And we're gonna go through these um, and talk about Project Aurora. So Project Aurora was actually uh, an attack, we think, by a nation state, and we'll get into why it had to be a nation state, but it was over December and January of 2009 and 2010, and the reason why is they picked a time when the networks would be lightly defended. People are out on break, they're not really thinking about what's going on with work, they're thinking about Christmas and the holidays. So what, what made this such a game changer was that if you lived in the military industrial complex, um, really in any country, you were already the target of these kinds of scales of attacks and with this kind of sophistication. But this was the first time we saw them going after a civilian set of companies. And what they went after is they went after infrastructure companies. So it would be things like Adobe, Google, Facebook, the kinds of companies that build all sorts of the infrastructure we need. Qualcomm. They went after Qualcomm too? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, there were about 200 companies um, that had never faced this before, which is why they were really unprepared uh, to have this. And they used this exact model to do it. So the first is uh, reconning um, of systems and people. So we'll start with systems. If I'm going to penetrate a system, the first thing I wanna do is go see what the defenses are. Everybody's got perimeter security, everybody's got internal security, everybody has all of the, the tools and the devices that you would need in order to protect your environment. But what I want to find out is, do you have any unpatched vulnerabilities? Um, there's a pretty good instance of a company called TalkTalk Talk in England that bought a company, then divested it, and found out when they got penetrated that there was a web server that hadn't been updated in three years. So all those patches are now out there. Um, the information is out there. So one of the first things I do if I want to go penetrate a company, I want to go find out if they've patched their systems. Because I've already got the roadmap of how to get past whatever that, whatever that vulnerability is, and if they haven't patched it, I'm in. So what we look for is we look for, um, and this becomes an even bigger problem in the IoT world where you're actually putting mass devices out there where people aren't changing the passwords. They have the default passwords out there. You'll find companies that'll have an anonymous FTP set up, and it's mainly is something that's easy for their engineers to be able to get in and out of their systems. Well, if it's easy for them to get in, it's easy for me too. Um, so what we're looking for is vulnerabilities in the perimeter security, but the other thing is we're looking at code reviews. So if they're using third party libraries, open source libraries, the kinds of things where I can get to the code and I can find out if they've got something in their environment that they're using as perimeter security uh, that has, or any of their infrastructure security like their websites that have uh, open source components to them, I can go in and do my own code reviews and see if I can get in that way. But this is actually how they got in. How many people have a LinkedIn account? Yeah, almost everybody. Twitter, all sorts of social media. So what we do when we want to run a phishing exploit is we will first go and look at the company. I wanna know who the players are. I'm, we'll focus on IT. I wanna know who is in IT, who's in security. I wanna know what their names are. I wanna know what their job descriptions are because then I can begin putting them into groups, which units they work with. You're going to tell me, maybe not in yours or yours or yours, but the combination of them is going to tell me what your information. Are you running Nginx? Are you running Apache Structs? Do you have um, a, a web server that's based on Linux or is your web server an Exchange server? That's gonna tell me the, thing, the technology stack that I'm dealing with when I wanna go into your environment. In this case, they went after the relationships 
I don't really want the two people who sit next to each other. I want the people who are one degree of separation removed. I want to know that you know this person, but you don't necessarily know them very well. You've heard of them, and for example, um, how you sign off on an email. So my name is Matthew, but I don't always sign it off that way. I worked with a colleague that used his middle name. But if I saw an email coming from him where he used his first name, I would know that's not coming from him in a heartbeat. And if you get to know the people that are next to you and you know how they sign off their emails, you know do they use the Queen's English or do they use a lot of slang, do they use run-on sentences, you sort of get used to that. So you don't want the people right next to each other, you want the people that are separated enough that you know of them, but you don't necessarily know their habits. And that way you can do exactly what they did here, is they recon the engineers and the IT uh, staff, they learned who talks to whom, who's involved in which projects within the company, and they crafted their attack based on that. So one of the things, if you have a security clearance, one of the first things you, you sort of learn is to censor what you put out on social media. So if you noticed in my intro, I didn't mention any companies, I don't mention products, I don't mention any of the projects I've ever worked on. It's all very innocuous because whether you have a security clearance or you work in the security industry, you wind up having that information out there can wind up being used against you in ways that you really don't understand. So what they did was they went after their social media accounts. So next is the selecting the attack vector. So what we want to do is we want to take that information and we want to find the weaknesses in the environment. If we know they happen to be running that maybe there's a, a Google, um, there's a piece of Google infrastructure that we already know has some sort of a, a vulnerability, that's the place we want to attack. So in this case, um, you can use their information that they've given you to help plan your attack. And in this case, it was a phishing attack that was that the emails were sent from one colleague to another. Just enough distance so they knew who the person was, but they didn't really know enough about the person to know if the email that came from them was the email that really came from them. Because the emails look so genuine that they never even bothered to question them. So in this case, and it can be anything, it can be you can go in through the front door, so you can attack the security directly. That's what happened in the case of TalkTalk, Talk, Equifax. These, are, these were direct attacks into the infrastructure. Uh, in this case, they used email, but you could use USBs. Anybody you know what a rubber ducky is? Yeah, one person. So a rubber ducky is actually a, it's a penetration testing device, and what it does is when you plug it in, it acts like a keyboard. So it looks like a regular USB stick, and if you go drop this somewhere and someone picks it up and sticks it in their computer, well, now it's going through your computer and now it's penetrated into the system and you're done. They've already got their beachhead in, so they can skip all of what we've just talked about. So sometimes these attacks can wind up coming, if you have people who are willing to do this, can come in in the middle. So in this case, um, they sent emails that look so genuine that nobody questioned. Of course, it's Christmas. Everybody's thinking about Christmas and New Year's, so they click on the link. Uh, the exploitation, and this is sort of what makes us believe that this was sort of a nation state, because the number of zero-day exploits, which are zero-day exploits, are exploits that no one has ever seen before. It's not the um, not something that's been reported. It's not something that um, that we already know about. It could be patched. It's something that they have have found themselves in the intelligence industry. They call these equities. So they burned a bunch of equities to make this happen. Uh, more than just a small group could be able to do, would be able to do. So in this case, when you've exploited it, what they've done is, is they found a zero day to get out of the sandbox of Internet Explorer. And once they were done, they were in the system. The next thing they do once you are at the installation stage, they go in, they download. Uh, what, what was really unique about this was how heavy the encryption was. So it was encrypted more than one time in order to get past anything like virus scanners. So they would immediately go to the command, the upstream command and control servers, download more malware, begin to plug into that beachhead, which was that workstation. And once they're in there, they now can operate as the security privileges of the user that's in there. So you're logged in, you have a certain amount of privileges in the system. Once they've got their malware established in there, they're operating with those privileges too. And then it's, after that, it's mostly over. Uh, we'll talk about beaconing tomorrow in, in the, the, the session tomorrow, but in this case, they, they're now fully under control. They've, the command and control system is now in, in control of that particular box. This is their beachhead where they can now begin moving laterally across the system. So there's, you can imagine the fingers are now just spreading out. Uh, and then action on objective. This is the part where they pretty much own your network 
from top to bottom, left to right. They've already moved into all the places they want. Uh, what they're going to do, what they did in this case was they were going after um, source code. And the reason why you want source codes, and we call that the golden nugget. That's the piece that you want to get because once you have the source code to a piece of product, you now have the ability to go develop your own series of zero-day exploits, which is exactly what happened, especially when it came to Adobe Flash Reader and Acrobat products. So uh, they got those, and within several months, we saw a whole slew of zero-day exploits coming out against those products, which are pretty ubiquitous in people's environments. So this is sort of how the how it works. This is sort of the, the process from top to bottom of how you attack a system, how you get into it, how you own it, and then you go and begin doing the things that you want to do in that environment. And by the time they've gotten to this point, it's almost impossible to get them out or, and, and you will have had very little time to detect that they're actually even in your environment. So let's talk about threat modeling. So threat modeling is the process where we document the system where we're looking for things like attack surfaces. We're looking for specific methods that someone can use to attack our systems. What we want to focus on here, and this becomes the key so you don't drown in sort of the information, is you want to focus on the data. Where does it originate? Who uses it? Where are we pooling it? Where are we holding data we don't really need? One of the problems that we have is companies have a tendency to be a bit whorish about data. Once they get data in, they do not want to give it up, even if that data has no real value to them. And once that data gets compromised, you can have data that goes back years, which can be used in ways that people don't really understand. So the big thing is to follow the data. So in the, in the, the stages that we're going to go through, is the, and I'm going to do part of this already just to set up for this talk, uh, scope definition. One of the things when you go back and you do this, you don't want to take the entire system at one time. You can't consume that much information. What you want to do is you want to begin carving off certain pieces of your, of your system and threat model those, and then begin going out. If you try and take too much at one time, you're overloaded by information and people will get to the point where they just cannot function it. If you go too narrow, then you're not focusing on, you're, you're going to wind up missing places where obvious threats come in and you will wind up having um, thought that you did a, a very good job but you really didn't get everything that you needed to get. So the first thing we do um, is you want to create a model of where the data is, where it originates, where it moves to, where you're using it, where it's getting consumed, where you're pooling it. So in this case, I've done the first two. I sort of picked the scope for us and then I did the model creation. So when we go through the workshop piece of this, this part's already done. Um, threat identification. We're gonna talk a little bit about trust boundaries um, because trust boundaries, we've sort of, we're, we're a little smarter than we were about trust boundaries than we were before. Um, one of the things that happens as you go through this modeling piece is that there is always sort of this surprise of, oh, I, I didn't realize we were doing that. Well, I didn't realize we were holding that data. Why are we holding that data? And that's actually a good thing to hear is that we, and this is why when you do this in your companies, you want the entire team involved. This is not just leads and architects. This is everybody from top to bottom who has any investment in that particular piece of the system is you want them involved in because you want everybody looking at the same information and you will, and you will see it in a very different way depending on where you are in that hierarchy. So the threat classification, we'll do this sort of at the end. Um, how much data are we going to be exposed? If somebody gets in, how much are we going to lose? Can they move to other parts of the system? Are there, in other words, we want to know is how bad is this? That's basically what you come down to is how bad of a threat is this into our system? Then we'll look at mitigation planning. So um, probably everybody here works in sort of an agile environment. Anybody still trapped in waterfall? Okay, so in Agile, um, this is where you're going to talk about what goes on your backlog and what goes into your tech debt and what goes into this iteration or this PI versus what you can afford to push off. Uh, and then validation. You have, have to have some way, in the same way that we have unit tests where I, I have my unit tests and then I go in and I, and I make a change, I want to run those unit tests again to see that if I've broken them. Well, we have a validation stage that goes after this, which you have to go through to make sure, did you make the problem better? Or did you create any other additional problems that you don't um, that you didn't realize? So, as we go through this, 
we're going to go through, we're going to follow the data. All of this is going to wind up being data flow work. Um, so we want to know where is it being held? How long is it being held? We want to ask questions like, does it expire? We, we, we don't want to just hold data for some indefinite period of time. There has to be some useful life to it. Uh, we want to know how important the data is. What safeguards, what other safeguards are outside of the system that we have some reliance on, whether we're implicitly relying on them or we're explicitly relying on them. A lot of times we will have sort of an implicit assumption in the back of our mind is, well, we've got perimeter security. Um, and, or, you know, this area, when we talk about trust zones, this is a trusted area and that's not. So we're okay here, but we're not okay there. It actually does not work that way, at least not in this day and age. So let's go through the exercise. And the first thing we need to talk about is trust boundaries. So in order for us to understand risk, we have to understand what trust is and how that trust affects the decisions that we make in our architectures. So different trust boundaries are going to carry different sets of risks. The internet is considered to be high risk because there's a low amount of trust. Inside your network is considered to be low risk because there's a high amount of trust. In reality, their risk measures are actually the same. So what we want to know when we define a trust boundary is we want to know where the data crosses from one trust level to another or where it crosses from a secure area that we control to an insecure area where we don't control it. Does anybody have any questions before we go further? Okay. So this is just, uh, we're going to use this example for uh, the rest of uh, the hour. This is not a physical model, this is a logical model. So in the center here, this you've got some sort of a capture process. This is just like a sensor. It could be video, it could be audio, it could be uh, radiological, it could be anything. Uh, you've got data down here and a configuration, so you have some data stores. You've got the ability to link out to a, a downstream server. So this server could just be for, it could be for command and control, it could be for um, just simply pushing the data out. So if you're doing something that is evidentiary in nature, you want to make sure you secure that. So that would be what this is. You can come over here to the uh, to the cloud. You go up to the, um, you're saving the data here in the cloud. You've got the ability to talk to it with a browser. Over here, you've got uh, a web server that can talk. And again, this is not a physical model. It's a logical model. So you've got a web server over here that can talk to the data that's in the downstream server. Uh, and then you've got, um, a web server or some kind of server. It, it, can, it can be any kind of server that you want, whether it's based on HTML or it's based on your own homegrown server. Um, and then you've got down here on the bottom, we've got some sort of a, a remote capability, which a lot of systems, again, this goes back to the whole putting Wi-Fi in pacemakers and putting Wi-Fi into insulin pumps. We have some sort of remote control capability for it. So the first question we ask is, where are the trust boundaries here? And that's your chance. Where would you draw the trust boundaries? So we have some places here where we cross, yeah. like on the, the internet. Uh, so that'd be here and here. Um, maybe we've got some, you know, where we're connecting into some internal server. We've got the same thing here. So that's sort of the traditional view of trust boundaries. Anytime we go across the wire, we're crossing a trust boundary. We own what's on one side, somebody else owns what's on the other. So the problem is, is that this is actually where we are today. Because if I'm inside this environment, what we're trying to protect is the data. So we have several pieces of, several data stores where we're actually holding data. And we make the, the implicit assumption that if we're crossing the wire, that's where it's dangerous. But everything inside the wire is okay. But the problem is, is it's not because once I've penetrated into here, now I can go after the data store. So we no longer have a trusted environment for that data to rest in. Either on the cloud where you have multi-hosting cloud, where you now have one cloud environment that holds the data for multiple people or multiple companies, but you also have data that sits on whatever the device is, but you've got also data that sits out here on the, uh, uh, on the downstream server, but there's, what about the rest of this stuff? I've got blue lines here where we're talking about static content. Why do we consider that to be a trust boundary? 
Yeah, exactly. So if I can get into the system and modify the static content that drives your system, I now have a control capability over your system. So we have to think about not just this data, which is the data we traditionally think about, but you have to think about this data, which is the data that is being used. Yeah. Isn't that a point of configuration as well? Yes, I, I didn't want to mark this up with blue lines everywhere because it sort of loses. I wanted to talk about specific things, but you're absolutely right. It does include the configuration because if I can get in and alter your configuration, now I've got the ability to alter the way your system operates. So yeah, absolutely right, good job. So when we go through this exercise, there are no safe spaces. I know we'd like to live in a world where there are safe spaces, but there really aren't. So we're gonna use the Stride model, and this was developed by somebody at Microsoft uh, quite a ways ago, and I, and, and I like this one too, simply because it's, it's, it's sort of easy to understand and conceptualize if you haven't done this before. So we're gonna look at um, spoofing. So spoofing is where I'm masquerading as another user, where can I get into your system with a set of credentials, for example, an anonymous access port, or you left the default password, can I do something in the context of somebody else? Where do I need to think about those areas in my code? Tampering, uh, this is just straight up sabotage. I wanna make it stop working, or I wanna make it work incorrectly. One of the worst thing, things you can do is you give it false, false errors, false warnings. Um, then people will begin to ignore those warnings and ignore the real data that's coming through. Repudiation, that's just can I act within your system without you knowing that it's me? Are there, and a lot of this involves logging and and uh, audit trails, so can I do something to the data in such a way that you don't know that I did that, or if you know that I did it, you don't know who I am when I did it. Uh, information disclosure, that's just exfiltration of the data out of our system. Uh, denial of service, you just want, that's a sort of a close kin of uh, sabotage. Sabotage, probably a little more subtle in that I don't really want you to know it's, that it's sabotage, but in this case, uh, denial of service, I want you to know that the system isn't working. I wanna blind your, your system if it's a sensor. Uh, and then uh, privilege escalation. Uh, that's just, I want to be able to use the privileges you have in order for me to escalate up and begin to do other things inside your system. So I'm not gonna go in order of this. Um, I know it looks like as I'm starting with spoofing. Um, but I wanted to take the ones that were, um, a, I think, higher priorities than we have uh, and go with those first. So where would I want to spoof your system? Where could I spoof your system? And if we need to go through this diagram, again, tell me, and because it's important that you understand the way this works, because it'll be much easier for you to understand where, where these vulnerabilities, and more importantly, where the attack surfaces are. So let's start with where are the attack surfaces if I want to spoof your system? No safe spaces anymore, it's all the same. So where would I, where would I start by spoofing? I mean, I've got to get in from the outside first, right? So, right. So, we're, right. So where are the places where I would need to authenticate into your system to do something? Uh, I got like five answers. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a mobile problem here where you've got he's going to have to authenticate. Hopefully, he's authenticating into your into your system. What about something else? Yeah. So this server that has to authenticate in, in order to be able to retrieve the data and have that connection. Uh, we also have browsers. So all these browsers hopefully are authenticating somewhere into the system so that you can, you can actually verify who you're talking to on the other end. And then we have the one we didn't talk about, which is the cloud repo. So this upstream server is pushing stuff up to the cloud, but it also has, if, data is, if you can delete data here, then that it's possible for that to filter up here. And that, and when you're talking about something like video evidence, maybe in a courthouse, uh, you're talking about something that's now evidentiary. It's, it's part of the evidence of a potential of a crime. So now you have to have audit logs. So these places, all these places in our system where we need to authenticate in is the first line that we have to look at as are we making them authenticate in a way that prevents them from easily getting inside. Um, how about other places? Remember there's no 
There are no safe spaces. No, it's a zero trust environment. You can always see static content gather credentials that way. Yeah. What's the golden nugget here in this particular diagram? And what's the thing we want most of all? Exactly. So you have to authenticate into these data stores. I know we're inside the wire here. We're inside some device here. We're inside some protected area behind firewalls and all of those things. But leaving the data open, and this was the problem with the SVN repos, particularly at Adobe, was is there was no protection around them. You, you could actually go create your own account into the SVN repo, and you didn't even have to have credentials in the system to do it. So this data, because this is the thing ultimately that we're trying to protect, you have to think about these in terms of being able, to, can I spoof my way in directly to that data and just grab the data? Forget the system, just go in and get direct access to it. So as we're going through this, the first thing you want to look at is, where would I want to authenticate who I'm talking to? Uh, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about um, validating who you're talking to. So many times we will allow people to even begin a conversation with us without having any kind of validation or authentication. So let's look at information disclosure. It should be fairly easy. Where's the first place we want to talk about information disclosure? Well, in this case, let's work inside out. Where, where's the information we might want to disclose? Yeah, there you go. So those are the things we have. That's what they're after. Um, so the first place we want to look at is, can they, once they've gotten into this system, and this is part of the spoofing, how can we prevent them from exfiltrating that data? In other words, can we build in a secondary layer that prevents them from being able to pull that data off and get it out of the system? What's a way that we could prevent that data from being useless to them, even if they get it? Encryption. We encrypt it. If your data is sitting in a raw format, again, let's go back to uh, Equifax or almost any credit card company that's ever been hit. You have credit card numbers that are right out there in the open for people to use. Um, and you can't use these little hashes because they're just too easy to break. And a lot of times they think, oh, well, we've, we've hashed everything, it's okay. No, not really, because it's just really easy to break. What you want on this data in here is you want that data encrypted at rest. So as soon as that gets written in, you want the data encrypted with some sort of industrial strength or military grade encryption like AES. You don't want to leave it sitting out in the open. And then someone brought up the static content. This not only tells, I mean, this not only allows me to get in and grab the content, which tells me how your system works, but it also lets me tell you what things you do to authenticate. You may be able to scrape credentials. You may be able to go in and pull information that, um, that gives you some insight into the access methods we're using. So is there anything else when we talk about information disclosure? What about the web servers or our servers of some kind? So we call these web servers, they could be anything that's gonna be an upload download server, that's gonna be whatever server we've created. What about these? What do those have that we wouldn't want other people to have? Source code? Yeah, it's gonna be things like source code. So how this server works, because then I can write my own server except it works slightly differently than yours and if I know how to spoof into your system and connect it up, now I've got a server that you may be, that this client may be willing to talk to. But see, if I don't know things like, what's the meta language that you're using to be able to talk between those two servers? If I get the source code, I know that now. So I can stand up my own server, which they, which can now be put in place of this and just simply talking to it from a different place. Yes, so if you've, depending on how you're handling your um, your caching, you've got things of these web servers, um, which are endemic to all web servers. They just behave in a certain specific way if you've got cached information. If you're writing your own and holding cached information in order to make it become, uh, to perform better, that's where I'm going to go, is these web servers to find out what, what artifacts that you've got sitting around that will tell me either how the system works or give me some insight into what you're doing to keep me out. So let's talk about denial of service. How could we deny, how, in what ways can we deny this system from operating? Okay. Uh, any security systems or anything, any other servers, uh, 
communicate from any Autodesk servers other than your own? Okay, so the so the response was is any kind of security that we have sitting around this, um, any kind of communication that's going in and out of the box, if we can block that with a traditional DDoS attack. Um, anything that would allow us to prevent for specifically here, because if this is our command and control, we want to prevent this, this link from happening up. So if this is an early warning, some kind of early warning system, this is where it's going to show up on the downstream server at some sort of a knock. which is exactly the, the places, which is the probably the Achilles heel of this, is because there is that distance between the client, this whatever this sensor is, and the downstream server. So are there other places where we could deny it? Yeah, can we turn it off? Can I get into the mobile system? <coughs> because this is the command... This gives me the, the ability to, this is the process control. So this is the process controls for the sensor, which means if I can get in here and just turn it off, then it's off. And maybe you have some early warning down here, but this is where, so what we're attacking is not only the command and control, but we're also attacking the parts that notify people. Or if you wanted to do a denial of service, you can flood this where all they're getting is false warnings. What, what happens when somebody gets hundreds and hundreds of false warnings? Well, they just start ignoring them. And then the real warning comes through and it's lost in the noise. Well, what else can we do? Malformed request. Sure, malformed request. We flood that with it. There's one other place where we could, let's say this is a video sensor. Let's say it's in a, uh, a plant. You want to penetrate the plant. This is a video sensor. It's pointed right in the area where you want to be able to get through. What could you do to it? Hmm? Uh, more short term. I just need it down for 30 seconds while I walk through its field of view. Could be, yeah. There you go, physically blinded. Don't forget the hardware. So tomorrow, uh, it, we're going to talk about a company called DigiNotor that was a software company that had, or actually it was a CA that had a hardware problem. It's blinded. If this is a video sensor, just Poke a laser in its eye. No one will see anything. So you've destroyed the evidence because the evidence was never collected. Any kind of sensor there or any kind of piece of hardware can be defeated from the outside. So when you're thinking about software systems, don't just stop by thinking when, when you're thread modeling it, don't think about just the software system. What would you do from a software perspective if there is a, if it's blinded, how would you detect it? How would you raise the alarm? That's a very different alarm than just, oh, somebody walked past my field of vision, or I got this blip on a radiological sensor. So you have to look at what are, from a software perspective, what are the ways that it can be defeated, in this case, by blinding the hardware. Does anybody here work in the embedded world? Yeah, a couple of people. Yeah, that's where I came from. So I've had to deal with the hardware end of, of software for a long time, and one of the things you get used to is you get used to thinking about, well, what happens if we have a hardware problem? How does the software adapt it? So when you're thinking about attack surfaces, that's a completely legitimate attack surface if you're dealing in a hardware world. What is next? Elevation of privilege. What places would I want to go after if I wanted to get credentials to elevate my privilege? And in this case, what we're going to look at is where am I likely to have the highest privileges? Yes, yeah. From the mobile to the web server, that's actually controlling this sensor. So the web server will probably have higher, but I'm talking about where can I, because it's going to be really hard for me to, unless I penetrate the web server itself, it's going to be really hard for me to do a privilege escalation using the web server. What pieces in here are pieces that I've written that are running with a high amount of privilege that I could penetrate and get that privilege too. Because a pro privilege escalation is, I come in as unprivileged. And uh, if you, let's see, I guess it was the, the second talk at CPCon last year, I actually I did that against an unpatched Linux where I was running as a normal user, but I took advantage of, of the threading problem they had uh, in their copy on write to escalate privileges to get root. So where in here would I want to attack if I thought I could get a privilege escalation attack? 
Well, that's data. What process? Because that's what you attack as a process. Yeah. He's going to have a lot of privileges. Why? Because he's going to have to talk to all these databases. He's going to be able to talk off the box. So this is one that's going to have a lot of privileges. What about another one? If you come tomorrow, we're going to talk about that because that's actually a really great hack. I love that one. Um, and what they'll do is on the hardware, if they remove the, the JTAG ports, and so you've got this little box, but it's actually got the pads there for it, you're just going to repopulate the JTAG port. Yeah, you're back in business. Where else? There's one other process in there that is guaranteed to have the keys to the kingdom, especially if this is hardware. <laughs> yeah, we did that one. That's this one, the client. What about the capture process? The capture process has to talk to everything. Talks to the databases, talks to the hardware. If you have an operating system on here, this is going to be a very high-privileged part of your system. So just in terms of this guy here, you're going to wind up having the highest privileges here on the hardware, because this is actually downstream. But here on the hardware, it's going to be this upload, download client. It's going to be the capture process. And then it's going to be the, under end of the other end here if you're trying to go after the data itself. Maybe you want to prevent, maybe the way instead of blinding the sensor or turning it off or making it so it can't get the data, maybe your way in here is to just prevent, the, oh, the data is received, but it's thrown away. You just throw it in the bit bucket. Does that make sense? So really the biggest piece you want to focus on is this piece here. Because this will have almost all of your high privilege stuff that if you can get onto this box, and you know you can, you can get onto it from here, you can get onto it from there. If you can work your way onto that box, now you control the very thing that captures the data to begin with. So what does that give you? That's the thing that you want. That's keys to the kingdom, yeah. Now I can go in, I can stop it from, from as this privilege isolation, I now have full control over that system. So instead of me having to alert any of these other systems that might say, oh, wait a minute, there's a problem here, now I can very subtly go in there and I can now inject my own data into the sensor. I can inject, because you'll have device drivers, this thing will, this thing will be sitting on top of an operating system with device drivers. You can go in there and inject it right into the device driver. They will never know what you're doing. It'll look just fine. It's, it's kind of like the one where, um, uh, you know, they take a picture right behind the, uh, the camera and then they put the picture in front of you, seen in all those cheesy spy movies, and they put the picture in front of it. Well, in this case, that's basically gives you the ability to do is go in there and begin injecting your own data right into the device driver. And they have no ability to, to even know the difference until it's all over. And if you're stealthy enough, you can do that for a long time and they won't have the ability to know. Uh, let's see, repudiation. So repudiation, it's always a hard one. Repudiation is just, can I operate within your system without you knowing it's me or without you even knowing that I was there? So where in, from a repudiation standpoint, where are the, pl the places we want to start looking at? Which places? <coughs> Up here? Okay. So I want to know any time that you have the ability to affect the data. So let's say this is video, and let's say it's now evidence. So you potentially have evidence of a crime. I want to know from the time that that capture process creates it to the time that it's actually in here and being viewed, I have to have an audit trail. 
because if it's evidence, you need to know was that evidence tampered with, was that evidence, uh, was it incorrect? So in this case, the first place I want to look at is I want to look at this transfer here. And I want to make sure, so this is, this is either going to be, depending on how it's done, it's either going to be over the air and Wi-Fi, or it's going to be um, a hard wire. But I need to know that the, I need to track that evidence that goes from here to the server. And the reason why you need to know that is you need to know where every bit of that evidence crossed some boundary, which are these two, these two pieces here. So we'll talk about this here in a second, but this is, these are the pieces where you need to focus first is because these are the ones that are actually going over the wire. They're either going over hard wire or they're going over the internet. So you have to make sure that the logging that you put into these places here that you know I have authenticated against here, I've transferred this amount of data, this authenticated here transferred the same amount of data, there, the, all the checksums fit. So there's, there's nothing in it that we can, we can go and we can say, I have a full audit trail across that. But then there's also the capture process. I need to know that that capture process is actually working correctly. So one of the things that we do on a capture process is we need, always need to go and do sort of an internal set. Remember, we just got finished talking about if I can escalate privileges, get onto your system, I can now begin messing with the device drivers. This process here, because this is the beginning of the chain of the evidence as it works its way through the system, this piece has to be, and if you're beginning to see a pattern where we're starting to identify the same pieces over and over and over again as we go through this, we are, this has to wind up being the place where that audit trail starts and where you're sure that what that sensor sees is accurate. So this goes back to how do I know when it's being blinded? You need to be able to log those events. Anomalies need to get logged. Um, any kind of access to that particular portion, any time that, that that piece of software is being updated, that needs to be logged. What did I go from? What did I go to? So this, what this does is this gives you assurance that if you think there's a problem, you can go back into the logs from here all the way over to here and you can find out where did every bit of that data go from the sensor all the way to where I looked at it. And this is the last one, tampering. <laughs> so where can I tamper with my system? Yeah, so we've got, but it's, it's the, the, when we talk about an attack surface is where do I attack? So we know um, in this, we know that's where the data lands, but where would we attack? Where is the attack surface? So an attack surface is really just the point at which, it's the point at which I'm gonna try and penetrate. Yeah. So ba basically when you're cascading, maybe more data, so uh, not more data storage, but, um, sorry, I'm gonna bring this down. Uh, basically, um, connection to your external servers, that, that way, for example, if you want to keep track of what's going in and out, not just with data, but also externally. Right. So in this case, we've got command and control coming across here where we could tamper. We have data that is where it, it can be read from here. One of the things we want to make sure is we can't delete from here. So if you look at the where we have places where we can delete sensor data, those become critical spots. So in this case, this transfer mechanism here, this has the ability to delete, that has the ability to delete. Tampering is not just tampering with the system itself, it's also tampering with the data. So why did we delete this data? Was it transferred? Do we have confirmation that it was transferred before we deleted it? Why was this deleted here? So as you're beginning to look at your systems, as you follow the data flows, ask yourself what happens with that data? Why does it get deleted? Where does it get deleted? Have you logged the fact that that event actually occurred? So the places where we want to attack are going to be places like you said, where we have the ability to go into the system from the outside and then obviously the front uh, where we can actually tamper with the device itself, the optic. Anything else that we might want to tamper with? We said it actually earlier. Let's see if anybody remembers it. Well, we, yeah, we sort of got that at the front. Is there... 
log files as well? Yeah, we can go mess with the log files and the audit trails. Um, yeah. Such as alter the configuration. Alter the configuration. Sort of a little more. The, so the problem with altering the configuration is that if they're paying attention, they're going to notice you turned it off. Um, because if this is a downstream piece here, they're going to know, wait a minute, why did this guy just go off? Um, there's a little more subtle place where we could tamper with it to get it to do something we don't, that it's not supposed to do. Yeah. So all the static content, the source code on the web server, all these, all these pieces that we don't think about that are, you know, your scripts. So how many of us go put Python scripts into our environment and they do some things that are pretty critical, right? Because they're, they're, they're easy to put together, they're simple. I need to change the script, I just go drop it on there. Well, if I can go and change the script as the engineer, there's no reason why once somebody's on my box, they can't go change the scripts too. So this static content that we, we tend to think about as being static, a lot of times is easy to make it non-static. Any questions? Is this making sense? Because I have some people nodding, I have some people sort of, yeah, it sort of makes sense. It's a di what it is, it's a different way of thinking. If you've ever spent any time um, around somebody who's done this for a living, you will see they see the world very differently. My quintessential example is, is that when we were all little kids, um, engineers would go in, they'd notice the microwave's not working, they'd open it up, they'd fix it, they'd cook their lunch, and they'd go about their day. Hacker goes in, finds out the microwave is working just fine. Cooks his lunch, sits there at the table wondering, how can I turn this into a bomb? How can I make this thing explode? We look for ways to create, create really great systems that perform well, systems that are rock solid. Hackers look at how can I make the system do something you didn't intend for it to do. And so the thought processes are going to be very different when you go through threat hunting and threat modeling, however you want to call it. You have to look at this not in terms of how can I make the system work better, but is how can I break the system? How can I make the system do something it's not supposed to? Any, I mean, you basically have to get to sort of a level of maniacal thought that in many ways is actually kind of fun. I mean, it, it, if you've ever gone through this, it is, it, it does actually begin kind of fun, but what? Oh, I just comment that, that when I worked in the security group, we, uh, one of the criteria that we had for hiring people, and the, the guy who was running, he said, would turn to you boy and says, yeah, he doesn't have any people with this set. <laughs> okay, so Marshall said that when he worked in security, the, the, the hiring manager would come down to the conclusion whether he hired somebody is whether or not he had his evil bit set, which is absolutely, I know it's, it's strange to think this way, but there is a whole segment of people in this society that think exactly that way. And if you, and to, if you come to tomorrow's talk where we talk about hardware hacking, and we talk about the dark arts of being able to hack into hardware and software and what that means to us, you're going to find out so there's, there's some really smart people out there figuring out some really devious ways to break systems. And you have, to, you have to be willing to face the fact that maybe your baby is ugly. Um, we, we're okay with that if it doesn't perform well. We're okay with that if maybe the code doesn't sort of work right or there's a better way to do this. But we've never thought about just straight up abuse of our systems, which is really what you're having to do. But you're, you're abusing it in a very specific way. So this will give you an idea of if you go through a threat hunting exercise with your own systems, this is sort of the thought process. And I saw a lot of people when I'd say, well, what about doing this? And they go like, wow, I never even thought about that. I say, yeah, I thought about that because I think about this a lot. So my evil bit is set, but it's, a, it's only set in certain contexts, um, which is to make the systems that I build and the systems that and the people that I work with better at what they do. What's yeah. your response uh, when you get that pushback from when you raise these kinds of questions or concerns? Nobody would do that. Or, yeah. But yeah. Our, our system isn't a high enough uh, uh, target, value target. Yeah. So uh, the question was: Is what do I? What's my response when I get uh, pushback or people say, "Well, you know, nobody would do this," or they can't do that? Uh, I have an entire laundry list of hacks out there um, where people have pulled some just. I mean, they're just magnificent hacks. I mean, I can appreciate, yes, it's totally destructive, but I can sort of appreciate the thought that went into this. It's sort of the maniacal 
impulses they have that allow them to get into it. And that's what I begin talking to them about is, okay, let's look at something that you think, like, for example, Aurora. That's why I started with this. Because most people would think, how could you go after 200 companies at one time? And, and there was a line on the, the, the slide that said attribution is, is somewhat difficult. I mean, it is difficult. And the problem is, um, in this case, we think it was the PRC that launched Aurora. Uh, Aurora. Um, but maybe it was North Korea making it look like the PRC did it to take the heat off themselves. That would not be atypical for North Korea. Maybe it was the NSA. Making it look like North Korea was making it look like China did it. I mean, you laugh and people will say, God, oh, that's crazy. But these things happen all the time. I mean, you will dig, if you dig deeply enough, you'll find out as some people have been seeding their malware with indicators to point off to the, somebody else. So the reason why people have a hard time understanding is the reason why they will look at it and say, oh, come on, that can't happen, or who would do that, is we'll think of the evilest kid you knew in junior high and go give him an advanced knowledge of hacking, and that's the person. I mean, these are, these are people who really genuinely groove on defeating the systems we put together. For them, it's a sport. They are totally dedicated to getting inside. It's a challenge for them. And then they'll take that data or whatever they've gotten from you, like the source code, and they're going to go use it in some malicious way. So we turn around almost weekly and we hear about, you know, this penetration and that penetration. These guys got owned and these guys. And, and if you go, there's a, uh, a website called Have I Been Pound? I can't say it correctly. It's, the, it's Troy Hunt's website, and I can never say it the way he says it. But if you go look at the volume of credentials that have been stolen that are in his database. You can put in your email address and find out if it's been in a compromise. There's terabytes of data in there. Um, and he's getting all of this off the dark web or people are sending it to him from this breach or that breach. I mean, it's a horrific level of data. And some of these, and, and for a lot of these people that go into this, I mean, this really is an art form for them. That's why I sort of call it the dark art. I mean, it really is as we, as we think of what we do as sort of artistry, they think of it that way too. So I have this list that I walk through and think in presentations like this where we go through things like Aurora and tomorrow would be even better. There's tons of them tomorrow. Um, to make exactly the point, it goes on every day. Yeah. Like if I'm not supposed to really like that you can put that one that you can end with the best in the values if it's if it's just stolen. Y yeah, go but out. Yeah, because I was like, I see the like, credit card here. No, 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 no. No, it's not. Um, no, I know Troy Hunt. In fact, uh, I was on an interview. Uh, John Cal uh, interviewed he and I and Ava last year. Uh, he's a well known security researcher. It's go, have I been pwned? Just go to his, go to the Troy Hunt website and there will be a link that goes to it. It is not a scam. Okay. I go there routinely to find out if my credentials, because I've been in a couple of breaches. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to, but you would be horrified at the level of information that they've gotten out of these breaches. I mean, your home address and, and they know, you know, who you're married to and how many kids you've got. And, and, and he's done it on himself, so he'll put something in there and go look up all his information. And it's just like, oh my God, this is just horrible. So it is pervasive. It's, uh, there is no, um, I'm hoping we're sort of past the denial stage. So we're sort of in the, what, the 12 steps of, of, uh, recovery and then one stage is anger and another is denial. I, I hope we've gotten most of the CEOs and the people. I rarely have people who, when they come to me, um, are in the denial stage. They may be for a few minutes and then we walk them through some of this and then it's like, okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, what do we need to do? Anything else before we go on? So, threat classifications. Um, almost everybody in here does Agile. Does everybody use Fibonacci numbers to do your story points? Yes, maybe, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Uh, so I did this just sort of on um, when we want to classify it. Uh, privileged parts of the OS, that is, like, uh, that is like the perfect storm because you really don't have the ability to, to, uh, to deal with that from your system standpoint. That's a patch that has to be made into the OS. Uh, all the way down to low priority systems running on the operating system. Now, just because I have a low priority, I'll tell you a story tomorrow. If you come to the talk tomorrow, I'll tell you a story about a low priority system that burned me pretty badly. Um, the fact that it's a three doesn't mean you can ignore it. It just simply means that it has less, there's, it's going to be a lot harder for them to make use of. 
Then you have how easy is it to exploit. If it's trivial, it's right to the top of the register. If you have to put in a lot of work, it starts to come down. If it's almost impossible, um, and when we look at, and the reason why we want to identify the attack surface is the difference between a garden variety bug and a vulnerability is how close that bug is to your attack surface. If it's right at the attack surface, that's a high value bug because that's one they can exploit. If it's several layers deep where they're going to have to really work to get to it, then it becomes something that you can defer the work on because, you know, when you, when you do Agile, you go through sprints and some of this becomes part of your tech debt, some of it goes in the backlog. So the questions you want to ask are how much damage can it do? How hard is it to get rid of? Um, things like that. And these are not hard questions. It's really about what you find as far as your, uh, as your system. So how does this fit? So in Waterfall, it actually fits pretty easily because when you do this, you're going to get in a room, depending on how big a chunk you've carved off, you're going to be in a room for a couple of days to a, a week. Um, if you get past a week, you probably are um, not going to really be able to focus. You're going to be missing things because everybody just, you know, nobody wants to be trapped in a room. So you don't want to stretch it to a week. You want to do a couple of days at a time. Uh, so it fits pretty easily into a waterfall because you do this mainly in the design stage when you're doing it because this is inherently an architecture piece that you're going to, it's documenting your architecture and it's documenting how your architecture fits together and where all those attack surfaces are, what the attack vectors are. Agile, it's a little more complicated. Um, so Agile prefers working software over documentation. This is documentation. There, there's no working software here. This is about diagramming out your system. It's about uh, going through it in sort of a painstaking detail, trying to sort out, um, this is like the beginning of an iteration where you're trying to assign story points to features. Um, only it takes longer and in most cases it's a lot more complicated. So it's best to use this during the architecture iterations. You might do a spike on this for two or three days, um, either at the beginning of the PI or you do it um, every couple of iterations when you're about to bring out a new feature. Um, then depending on where it winds up being the, the security, the, the high, the more important stuff becomes uh, part of your backlog. So you have to get that in the next iteration. So this becomes those high value stories, this becomes the, the ones that you have to prioritize now. And then the low priority ones get, part, get put into your, your tech deck. You can do this, it's just if for people who are agile purists, the first pushback I get is, yeah, but we don't do documentation and that's all this really is. So I don't know of anybody that runs a pure agile environment. We always adapt it for our teams and adapt it for our needs. This is one of the things you do sort of early in the, when you're putting in uh, new features or if you are finally like, okay, we've got a mature system, we need to go and do this. This may be a couple of iterations that you're doing this work in. So the benefits. Um, this is the beginning of everything. Whatever testing you do after that, this is sort of the beginning. This will point you in the direction of the places where you need to focus that testing because we can't do 100% test coverage against the entire thing. We have to begin prioritizing things. You'd be there all day if that's what you're doing. Uh, in this case, one of the things that it shows you is where we get emergent behavior because complexity is what breeds emergent behavior. And if you are not in tune with your system, you know, if your system is big enough, no one engineer is going to have the entire system. The, the current code base that I'm working on now has three layers um, and five to 10 million lines of code. I mean, it is a massive product. I can't consume the entire product. Uh, but when you begin to pull off these chunks, what you'll get is this engineer will know the most about it so they can lead this group in going through this. But what you, wanna, what you want to do is you want to understand that system at a very deep level because the system is going to do things you're not going to expect. It goes back to why are we holding this data? I thought we got rid of that. Oh, I didn't know how this worked. Uh, bless you. And so we have these kinds of, this is what exposes that because this is like a deep architectural uh, review with security in mind. Uh, that also by getting everybody in the room, everybody now understands how the system works. I mean, sometimes when, um, when systems are changing a lot, you can sort of lose focus because I'm working on this piece, but these pieces I worked on before have, have now changed. Well, this gives you the ability to find those changes, um, not just for one person like an architect or a lead, but for the entire team. You can come sit down. Okay. So 
It also forces you to think about your design from a security context. Again, it's a, it's a mind process. It's, it's a mind shift in thinking, how evil can I be with this system? Um, I spent all this trying, trying to build this so that it's got great performance, so that it works very well, it's rock solid. This is the time when I want to look at this is how can I abuse it? How can I get it to do things it's not supposed to? Um, you also find design flaws early. Uh, sometimes when it's just an architect or a lead or a principal engineer working on the design, they'll get caught up in the design, whereas somebody from the outside will come in and look at it from a different point of view and a different vantage point, and they're going to come in, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, what about this? And suddenly they're like, oh, you're right. So this makes your design stronger before you start writing code. The time to find out that you have a bad design is not at the end of an iteration, the end of a PI, or it's the you know two weeks before you're due to ship your product. It's You want to find that early. Uh, and then finding pool data where we don't, where you don't need it. Um, again, so many of the breaches, uh, because we tend to be a little horish about data, we tend to just want to keep it all. We, you know, we don't throw data away uh, because you never know when you might need it. Um, there, it's, it's almost like OCD in a lot of companies about pooling data that they don't really need, and yet it's that very data that somebody goes and gets, and it winds up ruining uh, their life. Uh, the cost, there's a lot of commitment. Um, you, you ha it takes time to do this. You usually have to get someone to come in to walk the team through this a couple of times, and then they begin to sort of get the groove, they know what to look for, and they begin uh, working on it. It does require a significant amount of security knowledge. How many people feel like after the, we've been in here for an hour, how many people feel like today they're evil enough to be able to go in and tear a system apart like that? Yeah, like one person, a couple, yeah. I think you were that way last year, so yeah, yeah you're good. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that it requires you to either be the kind of person who would go and hack in the system, which is not necessarily a good thing to hire people like that, or somebody who understands them and thinks like them, but is, we call them white hat testers or white hat security professionals, people who sort of already understand that they've got the mindset, they've sort of, you, you sort of know how things smell and you can follow that smell to find out where the places are that that system can be broken into. Um, you have to work to get this into an Agile framework and, and don't. Flame me that I hate Agile. I've worked in Agile for the last 15 years. In fact, even when I was working in Waterfall, I would iterate things. Um, nothing made me crazier than have this long dev cycle and then QA gets creamed two weeks before we're supposed to release because they've got to get six months worth of testing done in two weeks. Um, yeah? Right. To, well, we need a way to recover from that. Well, okay, this is a good idea. So, to me, that's one of the bigger causes. Of, or, sorry, bigger cause. Okay. Of, you know, like, and, and the hazards of that business or that, you know, that. How does that affect you? So, uh, the comment was that one of the costs is, is what is the trade off between security and usability? Um, it all depends on what your pain's worth. Um, you're right, it is. I hate it. Okay, so every 90 days they change the password. Uh, they force everybody to go through a password change. Um, absolutely waste of time. It, it doesn't solve anything. Um, so you have to make smart decisions. Um, being able to access data with no authentication is a horrible idea. Anonymous FTP, FTP is a horrible idea. There are all sorts of things we've used for years that we found out was really just a horrible idea. So you're right, there is a cost that is sort of a, um, I think we've gotten everybody to the point where they understand they have to log in, they have to have credentials, they have to be authenticated. And that's a judgment call as to how much pain you're worth. One of the problems that um, I do still find is that we do still have CEOs that sort of look at it that um, security is not a feature. Um, I agree, it's not a feature. But if you ignore it and somebody turns your software or the computer system that you're using into a pile of goo, it's hard to argue that you could be okay ignoring that. And I'm, I can make the case that security actually should be elevated not to a feature status, but to a bare minimum status. This is your, 
uh, we always talk about um, minimum viable products. If security is not a piece of your minimum viable product, you don't have a viable product. What you have is a hack waiting to happen. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember Lee Iacocca in Richard Nixon's office screaming and crying. I and mean, this is like a titan of the industry. We, every, he was supposed to be some sort of a god, but he was in the office screaming and crying because NHTSA wanted to mandate that you had to have shoulder harnesses in cars. Well, security has now actually become a feature. If, if, if your choice is being in a car where it gets into a small crash, you're going to wind up getting killed, or now you've got airbags, you've got lap belts, you've got um, an engine like my wife's Rano, or her, uh, her Yukon. The engine, if it's in a frontal impact, the engine is designed to collapse down instead of back onto her legs. That's a great safety feature. Um, most people don't know it's there because it's become so ubiquitous. But you'll know it there if you get into a head end crash in a car where the engine doesn't do that and it winds up in your lap. So, but at the same time, we have a trade off between like full six point harnesses and, and three way. Sure. Which might not be the best one to pair. Sure. But my point being, there, there's clearly a trade off. We could be wearing helmets with six point harnesses. Yes. So I agree. The, the, and the comment was is that there's trade-offs between wearing six-point harnesses and just wearing a lap belt or, with a, a shoulder harness. I agree. I've done a six-point harness and I hated it. Uh, <laughs> when I did air missions, it was terrible. Um, you're right. There is, there is always a trade-off. What you're trying to go, what you're going for here is not a system that is absolutely bulletproof because it doesn't exist. So if you're spending all this time cycling through this to try and get to perfection, you're not going to get there. You're just going to be spending a cycle. So you, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to raise the wall high enough that they'll get bored and they'll go someplace else to an easier target. I hate to put it that way, but we really sort of do that with our houses. Um, you lock your doors. You lock your windows. Maybe you've got a security device on. Maybe you've got a camera. Somebody looks at it and says, yeah, there's an easier house down the road. And then it all depends on what you're holding. If you're holding people's financial information, like the three, the big three credit companies, they'll write into hell with a bucket of water to get into a company like that because that is absolutely the very top of the list of information you want. You can impersonate people, you can run, you can do anything you want when you've got that. Um, and a lot of this is immutable data. You cannot change your social security number. So it all depends, those trade-offs all have to depend on what is it that you're protecting. In the case of what we went through, if this is um, a DVR in a police cruiser, that is extraordinarily high value evidence that you're protecting. Then you wind up putting the bar up here. If this is just my, an IoT device watching my child, the big thing I wanna make sure is nobody's tapping into that so they can hear you know, when, what my wife and I are saying in the room while we're feeding the baby or changing the diapers, those kinds of things. So yeah, you're right, it is always, there's always a trade-off. What you're really going for is, I want, to, I want to raise the wall high enough that they're going to decide there's easier targets out there. So the takeaways. Um, there are no safe spaces anymore. When you think about your system, don't think about perimeter security. It's, it's of absolutely no value to think of it that way. You have to think about the internals of the security as being a zero trust environment as much as the externals. Remember, we had a, an IoT device where we couldn't even trust that the capture process couldn't be subverted, so it has to authenticate into the data. We want to do encryption at rest. We don't want to leave the data out there in a form that people can use. Um, exfiltration has now sort of become the thing we're focusing more on because we realize to a certain extent we've lost the war of keeping them out. So now we have to assume they're in, and they're in deep, so now we have to, have to figure out how we prevent them from being able to get to that um, that data and get that data out. And then complexity is the enemy. One of the things I really like about doing this kind of threat modeling is that if you have to go through and you have to diagram out your system, you will begin to see how complex it is. Um, it's very hard to see that unless you sort of see it holistically. But once you've had to do this, you will get people saying it's like, oh man, I didn't realize we were doing it that way or well, how can this work because we've got this other thing that's in conflict with it. And you begin to see all the complexities of the, of the inner workings of your system, and that complexity is what creates the emergent behavior. That's the stuff where your system reacts in a way that you don't really understand. Uh, and then all exploits are bugs, but not all bugs are exploitable. It depends on how close they are to the attack surface. That's why one of the things we do in threat modeling is we identify the, the attack surfaces 
and the attack vectors. So the attack vectors are sort of in the stride, but then the attack surfaces are what you wind up finding in your system. Any questions? I just, those are standard data flow diagrams. Yeah. Is there like a, in the security context? Yeah, no. Uh, so the question was, is, was there a form or format that it uses? Those are, uh, there's, I think, two types of data flow diagram. It's kind of like UML. Yeah. So it's like there's two that are specific for, um, they were developed by two different people and they're specific for, um, uh, for tracking data flow. Uh, and so that just becomes a data flow diagram. Um, you don't really have to have a form. There is no standard. The, the important part is the fact that you're actually diagramming out the data flows. You're looking at your system in a holistic way and you're beginning to see how that system um, can be penetrated. Where are the places where, where we're gonna start penetrating into a system and then what happens when they get past this? Okay, and what happens when they get past this? And so because all security, when we're talking about whether it's a system security or it's, or it's uh, computer systems in a NOC, we always talk about security in terms of layered defenses. It's never the, this one little perimeter security isn't gonna cut it. It's gotta be what do you do inside. And we found that with Aurora. They got inside the perimeter security because someone clicked on the wrong email link and then their SVN wasn't protected so now all of a sudden they just started creating their own accounts to, uh, to get into their software repos and then the software repos led to the, uh, them finding all sorts of zero day exploits that they could now make use of in other companies. So tomorrow, um, right here at 9 a.m., we're going to uh, the talk is if you can't open it, you don't own it, and I'll explain what that means tomorrow. Uh, we're going to talk about the dark art of hardware hacking and why uh, hardware hacking is just a lot of fun. I mean, that's why IoT devices are sort of becoming the new target is because one, they're insecure, and two, because it's just fun to, to hack hardware. Um, so we're gonna talk about hardware hacking and we're gonna talk about how that applies to us because everybody in here, for the most part, is a software engineer uh, that doesn't work on bare metal boards. So what we're gonna talk about is things like supply chains, roots of trust, um, side channel attacks, and everybody talks about a Spectre and Meltdown as if that's sort of the end of side channel attacks. It's not, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg and there's all sorts of really cool things that you can do against hardware and then we'll see how that applies to software and the ways we design our uh, systems. So everybody knows um, that CPPCon is right around the corner and it's also right up the road. So it's in Aurora this year. Um, if you would like to volunteer, if you're local to the, the uh, Denver metro area, um, go to that web link and volunteer. Uh, we have a volunteer here you can talk to. I have never heard anybody who's volunteered to your C++ or CPPCon that just didn't love doing it. Uh, you get access to all sorts of things. You're involved in parts of the conference most people don't ever see, and it's just a lot of fun. And I'm on the staff for both conferences, so I can say that with a fair amount of authority. If you're outside of Denver, um, we have a grant program that will allow you to, uh, to handle your, some of your travel costs, your hotel costs, so fill out the grant program uh, form if you want to attend, yeah. I actually had someone ask me just the other day mm -hmm. um, if the grant program was need-based or just everybody. I said, it looks like it's need-based based on the um, on the website, but it wasn't clear. Okay, so the question is, is the grant program needs-based or is it, um, it's open to everybody? It is open to everybody. What we do is we go through and we look at how involved are you in the C++ community. So we do we, we do uh, want to promote people that are actively involved rather than just sort of the mildly curious who want to go to the conference. Um, so people who have, you, you write blogs or you've got open source projects or you know, you're a student. We tend to get a lot of students because it's professionals like me can usually get their company to pay for it, but we have uh, students who really do have a need. They can't come otherwise. So we do tend to, we will, we will consider everybody, but we do tend to look at needs pretty clearly and, and a lot of it also involves in is what is your involvement with the, um, with the community at large. So that's the same place where you apply for both being a volunteer and the grant program. At the same conference, I'm gonna be teaching a two-day post-conference course uh, called Exploiting Modern C++ and this is gonna be right after CPPCon. Um, we're going to, 
it's easy to take security and act like it's actually sort of a separate thing, but it really isn't. Security is really about writing high quality code. But a lot of times we know how to write code that performs well, we know how to write code that scales, but we don't really know the process that you go through to get really high quality code that is defect free. Uh, and what are the steps to do? So a lot of things we're gonna do in here is how do you do a code review? Not just for security, but also finding out those deep bugs that we tend to miss. And, and we do miss them. I mean, there's a lot of bugs sitting in, in operating systems that haven't been caught that sit out there for years until they get exploited. We're gonna look at testing methodologies. So we'll do a little bit of what we did today, but we're gonna do it on a, a, an actual running system. We're gonna go test it, find out, code review it. And then we're gonna go play capture the flag with it, which capture the flag is, um, is a game where you wanna go exploit a system. So we're gonna look at hacker tools and how can we exploit this part of the system and how can we take advantage of that vulnerability so that it gives you a real concrete understanding of the kinds of things that will come at your systems and then we're going to get those things out of your systems and see how much stronger it is. So this winds up being a, a two-day course, which should be a lot of fun, hopefully. Um, the point, though, to this is not just about security. It is, right, it is about how to write high-quality code uh, and know how to test it, verify that that code does have high quality, and then be able to know the kinds of ways that people will try and exploit it. So it's sort of an extension of what we did today. Uh, I also have a book coming out. In fact, it's coming out in the spring of 2020, which is going to be, it's, it's the same name, it's Exploiting Modern C++ Writing Secure Code for an Insecure World. This is sort of going to be a primer of how do I go from understanding nothing about security, nothing about the processes of writing um, highly secure or high quality code, and then you go all the way to the end. It's gonna be largely what we do in the, it's sort of gonna be an expanded version of what we do in the, um, in the training course coming up at CPPCon. But this is really focused on people who don't come from a security background, so there'll be lots of explanations as to how things work, how hackers think, how they're getting into systems. We're gonna look at the patterns of defects that we have a tendency to make over and over and over again that we, we don't see. Uh, and then what kind of testing tools are out there and testing methodologies which will allow us to um, put code out on the street that raises that bar quite a bit to where they're gonna have a much harder time getting in and exploiting our systems. Okay, any further questions? We have a few minutes. Is it going, going, going? Okay, you guys have a great rest of your conference.